People who don't make anything cannot buy anything. Never forget that. That's Ross Perot, American businessman and two-time presidential candidate during his 1993 debate against Al Gore on the controversial trade agreement, NAFTA. This is not good for the people of either country. The North American Free Trade Agreement aimed to promote trade between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, but Ross Perot saw a more sinister reality. He was quoted saying that if NAFTA is signed, you will hear a giant sucking sound of American manufacturing jobs leaving the nation. And in 2023, with labor shortages present and the middle class shrinking, his words ring true. Just look in your own hometown. These buildings that were once flourishing with life are crumbling. How did these trade agreements really impact the American middle class? And what are Americans trying to do to reverse the harm done by the government and large corporations? Today, we'll look at an industry that once fueled America's middle class, denim blue jeans. Turn your favorite pair of denim blue jeans inside out. Where are they made and why does it matter? This question's come to my attention in recent years and the answer is much more complex than I originally thought. I was born in 2002 and I always just assumed that things were made overseas. But how does this little tag on the inside of the garment affect America's middle class? Let me explain. In 1853, Levi Strauss moved to San Francisco to open a dry goods business selling blankets, clothing, handkerchiefs, and other items to the 49ers. The gold rush miners, not the football team. When Jacob Davis, a tailor from Reno, Nevada, contacted Strauss about a new process for making work pants reinforced with copper rivets, the two decided to patent the idea and go into business making jeans. Jeans quickly became the uniform of America, not because they were issued, but because they were an expression of freedom. Bell bottoms, acid wash, ripped, skinny, high rise, low rise, stretch. The market for denim blue jeans skyrocketed. A quick Google search will show you that a staggering 500 million pairs of jeans are sold in America alone each year. However, almost none of those jeans are made in America anymore. Why is that? Sure, our clothes are cheaper now, but what's the real cost of buying clothing made overseas? More importantly, what happened to the thousands of apparel employees who are no longer making these jeans? This town was once home to Levi's biggest supplier of American-made denim, White Oak Cotton Mills. During its heyday, these mills pumped out tens of millions of yards of denim per year for not only Levi's, but other American denim brands such as Wrangler and Lee. Industrial towns such as this thrived with small businesses, schools, entertainment, and steady wages. This is Revolution Mills, and this is a little bit different than White Oak. Although the White Oak denim plant is in shambles, this place opened up new life to the community, bringing small businesses, apartment buildings. But the fact of the matter is, it's not nearly the same as it was when thousands of workers used to cross that bridge to go down and work in the mills. I wanted to talk to someone who had seen Greensboro during its height. Meet 83-year-old Frank Doherty, longtime barber at Jeans Barbershop. Fitting name. Frank grew up working in a cotton mill, and he's been barbering at the same exact barber shop for 62 years. We know where we need to go because we know where we have been. My mother was a weaver in the cotton mill, so I know what American made it is. It's extremely important for the security of this country. Store shelves nationwide are dwindling or totally empty. You don't have to buy so much, take it easy, just relax. The COVID-19 pandemic showed us just how fragile our supply chain is and how overseas manufacturing can negatively affect Americans. So I asked him how he thinks we can fix it. His answer seemed so simple. Seen a lot of industry leave this country, trying to get the big money and the little man is suffering from that. People can't find the jobs they need. They just can't. We work hard. That's what it takes. It's going to take that for everybody to get this whole country going again back to where it needs to be. You know, where we can depend our own self, where we can live wholesomely, where we can have families born here, lived here, and raised here. All of us honestly going out and doing honest work and honest things, getting your paycheck and going buying something with it, with, with American stuff. Frank's message about working hard to earn a paycheck is as simple as it gets. But what about the folks who lost their jobs in the factories? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 1990, over 900,000 Americans were employed in the apparel manufacturing sector alone. In 2000, that number had been reduced to 480,000, and in 2011, only 150,000, an 83% decrease over only a 20-year period. 
Many of the folks displaced by the move for overseas manufacturing were forced to find new work and learn entirely new skills in order to support their families. You know, when you have children, you try to instill in them, by example, to love what you do. Angel used to work at a shoe factory in western Maine, but when it closed due to globalization in the late 90s, she struggled to find jobs within her skill set. Working at places that you absolutely, it was not for you, but you still had to do it to pay those bills, to feed those kids. It's not an easy task. But what about the folks that could not find work after their factory doors shut? I find it interesting that since we lost most of our manufacturing jobs in the late 90s, opioid-related deaths have simultaneously skyrocketed. A study by the CDC finds that there were six times more opioid-related deaths in 2021 than in 1999. Could there be a correlation between high unemployment rates and drug use? The opioid crisis may be far worse than initially thought. Let's see. Opioid overdose deaths have hit an all-time high in the U.S. More than 130 people in the U.S. die each day after overdosing on opioids. Manufacturing is the core of everything. Whether you can see that person wearing those shoes, you took part in that. It brings people together for a greater cause. Luckily, a few companies are finding success in bringing back manufacturing. This is Origin's Asheboro, North Carolina factory, where they're not only bringing denim production back, but other goods from hoodies to hunting clothes. Run by Amanda and Pete Roberts with the help of their partners, Kip, Dedeco, and Jocko. Origin's mission is to help rebuild communities by bringing back manufacturing jobs in areas that have been decimated by globalization, all while making their products on a 100% American supply chain. This factory appears to be firing on all cylinders, but just one year ago, it painted a bleak picture for the current state of American manufacturing. At its height, this factory produced 60,000 pairs of jeans a week. However, when Origin bought the factory, it told the story of the forgotten industry. Any production that was left was being suffocated by dimly lit rooms packed with idle sewing machines and garbage. The task of getting this place operational seemed enormous, but it paled in comparison to the 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears that it took to get to this point. Here's Amanda's new library for her new job. In 2009, Pete and Amanda, with their two young children, lost their small business in the Great Recession. Pete was forced to sell all of their possessions, except their house, promising Amanda that they'd never lose it. In an effort to try and make ends meet, he turned to his true passions, jujitsu and design. He began innovating the jujitsu gi. At the start, he imported them from Pakistan, but frustration arose when his foreign supplier sold his designs to a competitor. He decided to grab a chainsaw with a few of his closest friends. The goal was to erect his own factory, to safeguard his creations and revive domestic production. With no money, manufacturing knowledge, or machinery, the college dropout from Farmington, Maine was naive enough to think that he could spearhead a renaissance of American manufacturing. With the support of his friends, family, and two used sewing machines, Pete initiated gi production. I sew everything myself because uh, I need to make sure it's perfect. The only problem? He couldn't source the fabric in America. After calling every textile manufacturer in the country, he discovered that China and Pakistan were the only remaining countries with the knowledge to create these fabrics. That's when he stumbled across an old loom in an abandoned factory in Lewiston, Maine. Pulling this industry back here, right here in Maine. Now we're not just making these in America, we're gonna be weaving our own fabric. For the next six years, Origin's growth was slow. Sales were limited, and Pete struggled to make payroll for his few employees. Strapped for cash and his back against the wall, he threw a Hail Mary, remortgaging the house that he told his wife they'd never lose. The future was looking uncertain for the little factory in the woods of Maine, but failure wasn't an option. Favorite BJJ gi? There's a bunch of really good BJJ gis. I like Origin gis, and and um, they're in because they're made in America, which is cool. They're always sold out though, which is a bummer. If those guys from Origin gis want me to get in the game with them, if anybody knows them, tell me, and uh, I'll get in the game, and we'll we'll do something cool, and and get after it. Pete joined forces with Jocko Willink, retired SEAL, best-selling author, and top-rated podcaster. Welcome to the show, man. Starting in 2017, Origin would see unimaginable growth. That kind of manufacturing was literally on its way 
to oblivion. So, with new growth came capital to expand into new spaces and new products. The company moved into a 20,000 square foot space in Farmington where they ramped up production, using their lessons learned of making durable geese in order to craft boots and denim jeans. In 2021, Origin is ranked the 215th fastest growing private company in America by Inc. Magazine. Now, in 2023, Origin employs nearly 500 people in three factories across two states, a stark contrast to the 12 employees it had in 2017. This factory will help Origin to achieve its ultimate goal, to produce 1 million pairs of jeans a year on a fully American supply chain. However, this number pales in comparison to the 450 million pairs that are being manufactured overseas. If one idea from the woods of Maine can start a renaissance of American manufacturing, the American dream is very much still alive. So right here, this flag right here, if you view over here, it says this, the flag of the United States of America. This is to certify that the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol on April 12th, 1996, at the request of the Honorable Howard Cobble, member of Congress. This flag was flown in memory of the thousands of apparel employees who have lost their jobs because of NAFTA and the thousands who will lose their jobs because of GATT. But we're bringing them back. Here come the jobs.